I want to get an idea of who you are. Um, so, just very briefly, how many people here are entrepreneurs? <coughs> just raise your hand. And um, how many of you are investors? Right, so we have investors and entrepreneurs. So my topic today is applicable to, to really regardless of what you do, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're an investor, or whether you're an artist, or whether you're a business person or a non-business person. The theme is how to steal like Steve Jobs. And we're going to see a lot of examples of how some of the great creators have taken ideas from others. Microphone, please. So we're going to see how some of the great creators have taken ideas and transformed them and made them something rather unique and to themselves to create something new. So it's not about stealing. It's really about a process of creating that we're often not exposed to or a process that we're not perhaps comfortable with. And the purpose of my talk today is for you to, be, to really start thinking about this as just a new way of looking at everything that you look at. So just by introduction, um, my name is Patrick Kidziora. I'm the founder and CEO of Boiling Ice, which is my main website that describes a number of my activities. Um, I'm also heavily involved in the EdTech area. I'm the founder and CEO of Kedzo.com and Kedzodental.com, which are mobile and online education portals. And my more re recent interests right now that I'm starting to look at are, are startups in robotics as well as in cryptocurrency. So art is theft and theft is art. That's going to be the topic of discussion for the next uh, hour or so. And it gets at, at a very critical question. Are there really any new ideas out there? Whenever we see something new, is it new? Or is it just repackaged? Einstein said that the greatest artists, that the greatest scientists are artists as well, which I think is a wonderful insight into a great creative mind who didn't think of himself as a mathematician as a, and a physicist, but also as an artist. Because to really come up with great ideas, you really do need to be creative. You need to think outside the box. You need to do things in a way that has not been done before. You need to break the rules. And Picasso summed it up by saying that art is theft. And perhaps in recent memory, there probably isn't an artist that stole more from the past than him. This is actually one of my favorite quotes. Anyone have an idea, know who this lady is? Yes, right? Wonderful. Only those with no memory insist on their originality. Only those with no memory insist on their originality. I love that. That means you've got to be I don't know, so wrapped up in your own head that you actually think your thought is original. Right? That you don't remember the past, you don't remember where your ideas came from. But the reality is, is that when you're really creating, you're grabbing little pieces of ideas from everywhere. And you're reinventing them. You're reformulating them. So we're going to look at how there's been a lot of theft in a couple of different areas. We're going to look at art. We're going to look at music. We'll look at uh, movies. We're going to look at software. We're going to look at hardware. 
And we're going to see there's an awful lot of stealing going on. So another of Picasso's wonderful statements was that the bad artists copy, the great artists steal. What does that mean? What does that mean to some of you here? Any takers? If all you do, sir. Exactly, exactly. Copying is just copying. You're not improving it. You're not making it better. You're not making it different. You, know, you just copy it, put your, a new signature on it, but that's not creating. Right? The great artists just steal. They find something, but they make it part of their own DNA. And when it becomes your own DNA, it becomes part of you, and when it becomes part of you, you create something new. <clears throat> so this is an engraving from about the 1500s. It's over 500 years ago. And if you look at the lower right hand segment, that particular, just that scene, is a scene that's inspired a great deal of artists throughout the years. <clears throat> This is from 1515. And this is Edouard Manet's Le Déjeuner sur l'Herbe from 1863. He's twisted around a little bit in the previous one. Everybody is naked. Here, the men have clothes, the women, woman is naked. Right? Yes, they're having, they're having a, a breakfast on the lawn, but that is a little bit of the twist. Right? Picasso's from 1961. <coughs> and we see them side by side. So is, is this theft? There's definitely copying going on. They're this very, very similar, similar image. But they've been reworked. They've been reinterpreted. And they're paying homage to something that happened in the past. And I think that word is very important, paying homage, paying honor to other artists and what they've done and incorporating it into your own work. And here are just a whole bunch of different versions. Right? My favorite, by, by far, being The Simpsons. I mean, you know, that's, that's funny. But it's not just art. There's a lot of, there's a lot, a lot of stealing going on in music. Uh, it, it, for a number of years, there were all these lawsuits about artists, uh, music, musicians uh, being suing each other because they, they stole a piece of a, a, a drum solo, or they stole a piece of a you know, trombone solo or, or a guitar solo, and they would just kind of remix different clips into new songs. And that's all kind of settled down now, uh, where it's just kind of an accepted part of the music scene where you can take clips and then work on that to create something new. There's limits, and people are always uh, calling their attorneys to see if those limits have been passed, but I think we'll continue to see a great deal of that. Right. Now, Kirby Ferguson um, really said it best when everything is a remix which means everything is basically a reformulation of everything else. And I, I certainly uh, encourage you to find his book as well as some of his videos. I think you'll find them you know, quite interesting. We're going to look at a little clip here. Oh, we need some volume. He's 23 years old, and his career is just reaching its pinnacle. He's talking about Chris Bob Dylan. The voice of a generation and he's churning out classic songs at a seemingly impossible rate. But there's a small minority of dissenters, and they claim Bob Dylan is stealing other people's songs. 2004, Brian Burton, AKA Danger Mouse, takes the Beatles' White Album, combines it with Jay-Z's The Black Album to create The Grey Album. The Grey Album becomes an immediate sensation online, and the Beatles record company sends out countless cease and desist letters for unfair competition and dilution of our valuable property. 
The Grey Album is a remix. It is new media created from old media. It was made using these three techniques. <coughs> Copy, transform, and combine. That's how you remix. You take existing songs, you chop them up, you transform the pieces, you combine them back together again, you've got a new song, but that new song is clearly comprised of old songs. But I think these aren't just the components of remixing. I think these are the basic elements of all creativity. I think everything is a remix, and I think this is a better way to conceive of creativity. All right, let's head back to 1964, and let's hear where some of Dylan's early songs came from. we we'll do some side-by-side -side comparisons here. All right, this first song you're going to hear is Nottoman Town. It's your traditional folk tune. After that, you'll hear Dylan's Masters of War. In Nottoman Town, not a soul would look up. Not a soul would look up. Not a soul would look down. Yeah, I'm your masters of war. Here they build the big guns. Here they build the death planes. Here they build all the bombs. So that's the same basic melody and overall structure. This next one is uh, The Patriot Game by Dominic Bean. Alongside that, you're going to hear With God on Our Side by Dylan. I'm all you young rebels and list while I sing. For love of one's land is a terrible thing. Oh, my name, it ain't nothing. My age, it means less. The country I come from is called the Midwest. Okay, so in this case, Dylan admits he must have heard the Patriot game, he forgot about it. Then when the song kind of bubbled back up in his brain, he just thought it was his song. It's been estimated that two-thirds of the melodies Dylan used in his early songs were borrowed. This is pretty typical among folk singers. Here's the advice of Dylan's idol, Woody Guthrie. The words are the important thing. Don't worry about tunes. Take a tune. Sing high when they sing low. Sing fast when they sing slow. And you've got a new tune. It's <laughs> great advice. Great advice. And it, it's not just music. Right? You see plenty of examples in movies where uh, directors and, and uh, uh, people that, that, that make these great films take inspiration. You probably noticed <laughs> countless times um, various versions of that shower scene from Hitchcock, you know, with the knife coming right through the shower. Um, you've seen that a thousand times. This is something a little bit more recent, uh, which is really quite interesting, because when this was done, if you could start the video, we're going to see only about half of this video. Um, they specifically made the point that we're taking ideas from a whole bunch of other films and we're going to make a new film using their ideas. So if you haven't seen this Stranger Things um, series, it's a wonderful, wonderful series with incredible child actors. I mean, just incredible actors. So on the left is Stranger Things and on the right is the movie where it copied from. Skip ahead. This is a very long video. I said the, the uh, 
The original comparison is like about six minutes long. That's how much copying Stranger Things did. I mean, they just copied some great scenes from a whole series of really wonderful movies. And hopefully you've seen all the movies on the right, all of whom are you know, really just wonderful films in and of themselves. Who could forget that scene from The Shining with the axe, right? So what's the mindset of a good thief? Right? How, do you, how do you get to think like a thief? Right? How do you get to think creatively? Right? Well, as you saw, you need, to, you need to copy, transform, and then combine. But before you can do that, you need something. You need some great ideas. So who wants to guess whose desk this is? Einstein, right? Kind of messy, just like his hair, right? All over the place. A lot of ideas, a lot of ideas. Right? There he is. Right? Well, that's pretty obvious. That's Picasso's studio. In Steve Jobs' office. So if you ever walk into an office where there's absolutely Nothing on the off on the desk. Kind of have to ask yourself some questions. So you copy, you transform, and you combine. But the first thing you need to do is you need to start collecting, collect ideas. That has to start becoming a reflex for you, something that you do instinctively, something that you do every single day. And you just you're constantly collecting things. So if you're really passionately interested in all things mobile, look at all things mobile. Collect ideas from that. If you're interested in a particular art form, collect ideas from that art form. Copy them. Same thing goes for music. You don't even have to be to uh, discriminate particularly. You can just start c collecting things that you just like, good design which is a very broad statement, or good business models. So what, I, what I've done is I have a folder on my desktop, and on that desktop, I just, when I find something online I like, I just clip it. You know, I, I print it out, I export it as a PDF, and I put it into that folder. And I have that folder organized into different categories. So I'm constantly clipping ideas. I'm walking in the street, I see something that interests me, I take a picture, it goes into that folder. So in that folder I'm accumulating, what I used to do, which is accumulating you know, stacks and stacks of books and interesting pieces of art or uh, an extensive music collection, I pretty much digitized all of that now and it's just a folder on my desktop. It's easier to carry around when I go from you know, city to city. But if you prefer, you know, you could just put everything on your desk, have a room in your office, or turn your entire home into your collection den of, you know, great ideas that you collect. So collect them, and then go and look at them and think about them, play with them, copy them, transform them, combine them. If you've ever seen a fashion runway show, and at the end of the uh, fashion runway show, they always interview the designer, and they say, what a wonderful collection. Can you tell us about it? He says, yes, I was in Tuscany, and I was inspired by the colors and the wonderful food. It's always the same, it's always the same similar story, right? They copied something, they transformed it, and they combined it. And they tell a wonderful story, which makes it more inspirational and makes you buy more. But it hasn't been just in art and music or movies. We've also seen it in hardware. Now, some of you may know Johnny Ives. He's the Senior Vice President of Design at Apple. He's the man singly responsible for some of the greatest designs of things that we use on a daily basis. But he stole a lot of good ideas. This is Dieter Rams the chief design officer at Braun. 
For those of you that aren't familiar with Braun, Braun is a very successful, well-known German company that makes a variety of consumer products that have always been known for their design. And on the left is a pocket radio from Braun from 1958. Oh, wow, look at that, the iPod from 2001. Ha, huh. well, it's, it's been transformed, right? Well, it's the best idea, though, probably, it was this. We use a wheel. We all thought that was so innovative when, when the iPod came out. And instead of the grill for a speaker, we'll actually just put a little screen there. But you can, you can see the Braun product. It's right there. On the left is a speaker from Braun from 1959. 1959! And then on the iMac from 2007. So who's, who's the innovator? <laughs> Braun TV, 81. iMac, 2004. That's just a radio from 67. Mac G5 on the right. This is actually, I think, my favorite. It is my favorite. This is a radiator on the left from Braun, and that's an, a, uh, an Apple camera on the right. So you could be inspired by something that had no relevance to what you, you, you do, but yet its form inspires you um, to do something else with it. And there's, there's like a conversation that goes back and forth between Braun and Apple. Um, so you had the, the, the Braun digital watch in 2012. And then that's the Braun 2013. And then you had the Apple watch came out in 2015. And there's a new version of the Braun watch. And it's, it's, it, they, they're literally having a conversation. They're kind of playing with each other. They go, I, I see you did this. Well, well we're going to do it too. Right. And Steve was never shy about saying that. He just, hey, we steal great ideas. Now, I don't know if uh, many of you know the story of uh, you know, some of the great quote unquote inventions from Apple. But uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Uh, went up to the uh, research center for Xerox. Xerox is a, is a copy company, and they had an innovation center. Hey, isn't that a, something we hear about these days? They had a great research innovation center uh, in California, and they just did pure R&D. And uh, Steve and Steve were invited to visit their lab, and the director of the lab, a woman, uh, she heard about this because they got the invitation from home office, as I understand. And she, she was like, are you crazy? We can't let these, these people into our lab. And uh, home office in, in New York said, that's OK. Just let them in. You know, they're just kids. Well, yeah, those kids. You, didn't, you don't want them anywhere near your IP because they're walking around. And uh, they're going, hey, look at that. What is it? Oh, it's a mouse. Oh, that's interesting. Look, what was that? Oh, that's how you do that. Oh, that's really interesting. Oh, we have to do that. Right? So some of the greatest ideas that we now use on a daily basis came out of Xerox Park. Right? So truly, I don't know where the line is between inspiration and theft, but uh, it's just part of the history of Silicon Valley and the modern era. And it's only something that underscores what purpose do innovation hubs or innovation labs of major companies, what do they do and what are they supposed to do? Right? Doing pure research is nice, but you've got to commercialize it. If you don't, you've got nothing. So right, there's a little summary of various Braun products on the left and the Apple product on the right. And then we've also had this conversation. I'll call it a conversation. You can call it just outright copying. 
some people just call it competition because that's what competition is. You see something a competitor does and you say, hey, that's a really great idea. I'm going to do it in my product. So um, whenever there's a dispute, you know, the attorneys get involved. Sometimes you just hire attorneys so you can slow down your competition, not because you have a good argument. It's just a business strategy. But between the iPhone and Android, um, they constantly fight each other. Uh, so in the iPhone, the way where it started is what's interesting here is that on the left we have the Braun calculator. It's just one of the iconic designs. And on the right is the iPhone app for a calculator. This probably, this belongs in the earliest slide. So we see how the iPhone took some, some ideas from the IBM, what we call the brick. I don't know if anybody ever held a brick in their hand. It weighed literally a ton. It was just like this huge monster. But they, got, they picked up some ideas here. They picked up the window. Um, this had a stylus. Uh, Steve Jobs hated the stylus, but now the new iPhone has a stylus. And then you had the Google phone uh, that followed shortly thereafter, looking similar. Not exactly, but, you know, similar. So this is an ad from Apple directed at Android losers. This is the, so it's say, Dear Android Losers, because it was the L version of Android. Welcome to 2008. They're saying, yeah. 2008, uh, the iPhone had adaptive brightness, and Android waited until 2014 to get it. And it goes on and on and on and on like this. So I've, Android responds a few years later saying that, dear iPhone users, welcome to 2012. And this goes on. Right? If you look at uh, the, the differences between some of the phones right now, they're, they're doing this. This, is kind of, this was done in humor. Right? They're both kind of saying, you know, we're, we're competing. <clears throat> you also see it in software. Anybody know who this gentleman is? Yeah, Bill Gates. Bill Gates, uh, the very start of Microsoft when it was based in New Mexico. Uh, he still loves to drive extremely, extremely fast. That's what he likes to do. Uh, he got pulled over. I don't know why he has a big smile on his face, but he was certainly very happy. All right. So right when I was telling you about Xerox Park, here's that graphical user interface from Xerox Park. Gee, look at the Mac. That looks very similar. And then a year later, you have Windows. You copy, you transform, you improve, you combine. But there is a certain way to do it right. There's a way to do it ethically. And I think this is very important. And Austin Cleon uh, wrote a very good book called Steal Like an Artist, or Steal Like an Ethical Good Artist, I would add. Right? Which is the good artist, right, honors those that they steal from. The bad artist just degrades it, makes something much worse. The good artist studies something, really studies it tries to examine it, tries to understand where it came from. The bad artist just kind of quickly looks at it and makes a photocopy. The good artist steals from many. This is why you collect. A little piece here, a little piece there. Bad artist just steals one. Good artist, I think most importantly, or one of the most important things of all, gives credit. I was inspired by. So when Dieter Rams was invited to visit Apple's headquarters, he was asked, doesn't it bother you that Apple just has been inspired or stolen so many of your great designs? He goes, absolutely not. I'm flattered. 
And the good artist transforms, doesn't just imitate, doesn't just photocopy. You actually change the DNA of the item that you're manipulating. And the good artist, to sum up, remixes. It's not just a ripoff. Right? So you need to collect, you need to copy, you need to transform, and you need to combine. From a startup perspective, you could copy perhaps a, a business model. You can copy somebody else's market. You can say, oh, I love that market. Oh, I have this idea. Well, I'm going to kind of change that, but then I'm going to apply this revenue model to, the same th to, to that particular idea. So when you combine all those things, you end up with the ability to really have an idea of how to create. Right? And it's, uh, you know, one of the things that comes up a lot when I do this, this presentation is, what about intellectual property? You want to be respectful of where the ideas come from. Right? I mean, stealing is it's wrong. Um, but also, it's just, you know, where's, where's the fun? You know, how do you create? You say, well, what about some of the great, great new ideas that we have? If you look at, uh, you know, just some of the, 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 some of the big, big companies that now exist. You look at Facebook. Um, it's, social, it's a social network. But there used to be, at least in the United States, an ability uh, when you had uh, telephone systems to have something called a party line which means you could literally pick up the phone and you'd have maybe 20 other people on the phone at the same time. And as the phone system evolved in the United States, party lines became less and less uh, popular and it kind of disappeared at some point. And I see a lot of similarities between the ability to have a party line like 60, 70 years ago and being able to chat with your friends and share all kinds of photos and information on Facebook. And if you kind of think of Twitter, Twitter to me is nothing more than a reinvention of the telegraph. You send little short messages, dee 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 right? And that's it. It's just, but instead of sending it to just one destination, the destination you're sending it to is everybody on the planet. And if you look at Airbnb, to me, they've only reinvented something that existed years and years ago. Um, in the United States, as, you, as people went from town to town, they would see signs that said room for, for, for rent because you had people that own homes and they literally rented out an extra room and you get room and board. You get the room and you get dinner uh, included. It'd be Tra tra traveling salespeople or people just coming through town for a short while and they'll stay maybe a week or a month or so. Right? And they would stay in these rooming houses. It was, it was just part of the natural landscape. And then little by little, um, they changed the zoning laws and they got rid of that because it's, it's, you can make more money by building hotels and letting people let rooms in their own homes. And then the founders of Airbnb rediscovered that idea. Right? And it's in hindsight that we can see that. And I'm always looking for what did we do 50 or 60 years ago that have disappeared? And how can we reinvent that past into some kind of a digital present? So start collecting. Right? Make things, you know, look for things. And then put two different ideas together to make something absolutely, absolutely new. So I'll open up to uh, questions, um, thoughts. Are you going to start copying, sir? Uh, that's a very good question. That would be a question for an attorney. I'm not a copyright attorney. So I, I, I don't know. I couldn't address that. All I know is that uh, 
you know, you, you want to make it significant, you want to make it different enough that uh, you don't have to defend what it is that you've done by spending a lot of money on attorneys. So at that point, it becomes uh, commercially not viable. Thank you. So usually in everything that I do, I try to be the first. I try to incorporate ideas from other industries into whatever it is that I'm doing. And then other people uh, copy, you know, exactly. And I mean, even if uh, uh, we're doing something that uh, we're selling, uh, our customers appreciate when it's uh, something original and say, oh, uh, this is a copy when it's a copy. So even for business success, uh, ideas should be original. I mean, should be stolen in a good way, used, reworked, and uh, presented, you know, in an original way. We live in a, in a world where, one, it's so easy to copy things, right? You just do control C and you've copied something, right? We live in a world where you put something up on Instagram or YouTube and you've got somebody halfway across the world that, that sees it and says, that's a great idea. I'm just going to do it. So when they do the shows in Paris and they, they have the runways, in the old days, they'd have somebody actually sit there and, and sketch what the new designs were and then put it in a fax machine and it would go to China and they'd copy it. Right? Now they just take a picture. It's on Instagram. And 30 seconds later, it's being manufactured somewhere in China. You've got to compete with that. So I don't know if being the first with something is necessarily an advantage, um, which is why we've seen the birth of all these massive unicorns. And we hear about these huge rounds, companies raising 50, $100 million, is because not only do they have a first idea, but that idea needs to be implemented first in every single market in the world as quickly as possible. Because if you don't, somebody else will. All right, so Uber raise tens and tens of billions of dollars so that they could blanket the planet with Uber locations. Because once you're in a town, you basically own that town. There's, there's not going to be you know, too many competitors in any one city. Maybe two, maybe three. You know, but as you go beyond the one, their market share gets smaller and smaller. Thoughts? So who's, who's copying? Have you all created a folder on your desktop now and started to collect ideas? Really, collect them from everywhere. Different industries, right? um, uh, different countries. And that gets into an interesting question of what makes something entrepreneurial? Because when you look at um, what I call copycat entrepreneurship, uh, there's some great opportunities in that. It's called competition. And I think the, uh, uh, one of the greatest examples of that are the Sandware brothers out of Berlin. So they, they kind of institutionalized the process. They would see a great idea and they would copy it. So one of the first great ideas they saw was Groupon. So they copied Groupon and they did a German version of Groupon. And about three years later, Groupon got to Germany, and instead of starting their own group on Germany, they just wrote a check for 300 million to the Sandwar brothers, and they said, we'll just buy you. It's cheaper for us to buy you. And there's been lots and lots of examples of that occurring in other markets. So you, know, you go around the world, um, and you'll see copies of other things. They either you know, get crushed by the original that comes to that country, but oftentimes it's just cheaper for the original just to buy them out. It's just cheaper. Right. So if you, see op if you see things that you think are really cool in China and you say, oh, this would really be, this would work so well in Turkey. Well, wow, I see that, you know, that really cool idea in France. That would work so well in the United States. It's competition. Once the idea is out there, there's nothing you can do to, to take it back. But 
at the end, it doesn't matter how good the idea is, it always comes down to execution. So you can have a, see a great idea somewhere, but if you don't have the ability and you don't have the team to actually turn that into a reality, you don't have anything at all. So. Any other questions? No thoughts? You're going to start stealing? Are you comfortable with that? Yeah? <clears throat> is, is, that, is, that, is that a justification? I don't know if that's a justification. Well, you know, I, I, I prefer, I prefer yeah, in terms of business. It's business we're talking about. But you can apply this and these ideas to anything that you do. We see artists do it all the time. We see musicians do it all the time. We see people in the movie industry do it all the time. I mean, uh, even, uh, what was his name? The guy that invented the, the light bulb. Uh, he took one idea from Tesla and one idea from uh, another guy, and that's how he made the light bulb. So it's basically combining ideas. And if, if you can truly combine together. two ideas into one, you oftentimes create something that's radically, radically new and has major, major impact. That's where, I, to me, that's where, it, where you have those intersection points or the, the overlap. Edison. 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 Right? That's where you have the, the just amazing opportunities. Um, it's hard. It takes a, lot of, takes a lot of work. But if you just kind of develop that as a, as a muscle, because to me it is a muscle, I think that one day you can literally, you'll be able to lift a thousand kilos without a problem. So I wish you all great success in becoming great, great creative thieves. Right? And I bid you all a really wonderful day. Thank you.